All right. Okay, so let's uh, get in, do the introduction here. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight from the Dear One Public Library. Uh, we're honored and pleased to have uh, Mr. William Cohen with us tonight to talk about his book, Power Failure. Uh, missed a few notes beforehand. Beforehand, uh, we'll have a, uh, the talk for maybe about say forty-five minutes or so, and then uh, uh, 10, 10 minutes of uh, Q and A. Uh, and yeah, the, let's go with the introduction. Uh, Mr. William Cohen is a New York Times bestselling author of books, such books as Four Friends. Why Wall Street's Ma Wall Street Matters, The Price of Silence, uh, and House of Cards, and The Last Tycoons. He's a former special correspondent at Vanity Fair magazine, and he's one of the founders and also the Wall Street correspondent for a new media venture, a great, uh, great site uh, called Puck News. He has also written for numerous public publications as the New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, and the Financial Times. Uh, Mr. Gowen is a graduate of Duke University, the Columbia University of S School of Business, and the Columbia University's Graduate School of Business. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cohen. Uh, thanks, William, for joining us tonight. Uh, as I was talking Good before, I'm Really enjoyed the book, and I recommend highly recommend it. Highly recommend it to everyone. So I figured the best way to go ahead is to sort of uh, set the table here and talk about your background first. Uh, now, your I heard I in my research I did. Uh, there's, uh, uh, you worked for as a mergers and acquisitions banker for Lazard Trezier for many years. And they have a, there's an interesting story about how that, they, that uh, business came about. Lazard, you mean? Lazard. Yes. Yes. Lazard Frere, uh, it's French, it's French. Uh, it was started by three brothers, three French brothers, uh, uh, who left uh, the Alsace region of France, which is on the French-German border, uh, in and around uh, 1848, uh, when uh, people were being conscripted, men were being conscripted to fight in some French uh, war, and they didn't want to participate in that, basically. So they uh, left and moved to New Orleans, which, of course, has a big French uh, influence. And uh, they opened up a, a woman's uh, fashion store uh, in New Orleans, sold women's clothing, uh, and... Uh, the next year, that's in 1848, the next year there was a, uh, a fire that uh, destroyed the storefront. They managed to save a lot of the inventory. They then took the inventory they saved and decided to move to San Francisco. Uh, and they took their inventory across Mexico and then up the California coastline to San Francisco, where they opened another store selling clothes to the gold miners. Uh, and then uh, relatively quickly after that, they got into the business of sending gold uh, back and forth from San Francisco to Paris. Uh, and then that led them to, you know, opening a bank uh, to, you know, move the gold back and forth. So the bank called Lazard Frere and Company uh, started in San Francisco and then opened uh, branches in uh, New York, London, and Paris, um, and uh, uh, basically was a relatively small private partnership 
uh, until uh, more or less after World War II, uh, when uh, a lot of the partners, they basically had to close the French office, the Paris office, because uh, of the German uh, invasion of Paris, uh, with the leaders of the firm moving to New York, and really sort of getting into the business of advising uh, corporate CEOs on uh, buying and selling companies. And that, uh, you know, had a lot of, uh, uh, did a lot of well-known deals and uh, famous bankers worked there. And then, you know, I came along in uh, 19, 1989 uh, and was there for, you know, six years until 1995. Uh, it was a private partnership until uh, roughly 2006 uh, when it went public, and it's been a public, uh, public company since then. Uh, the name of the firm now is just Lazard and uh, trades under the symbol of LAZ, but I, I left in 1995. Then what did... And, uh, and I wrote my... Uh, and then just a quick aside, I wrote my which you mentioned, my first book uh, was about Lazard, uh, which I started in 2004, and that was published in 2007. Okay. And uh, now, when you worked for GE? Yes. And for a couple of years, right? For like two yes. years. Yes. So uh, uh, before I went to Lazard, uh, I went to uh, got my MBA, my master's in business from Columbia, uh, graduated in, in May of 1987. And then in September of 1987, started at uh, GE's uh, financial uh, firm, uh, part of the firm called GE Capital. Uh, and I was in New York, uh, providing, uh, financing for leverage buyouts, which was, you know, something I didn't know much about, but I did it anyway. And I did that for a year. And then I was, uh, promoted to go work for the chief credit officer up in Stamford, Connecticut, where the company was headquartered, uh, and worked for him as his, uh, chief credit analyst, uh, for a year. Uh, so I worked two years at G capital before going to Lizard. Okay. Well, uh, I guess the next question is what, uh, what gave you the idea for, for, to write this book or what, what was the spark, uh, to write it? Well, uh, you know, GE, uh, was, you know, one of the most important companies in not only America, but the world, uh, was once the most valuable company in the world. Uh, it was one of the most respected companies in the world. Uh, Jack Welch was, uh, named the CEO of the century, uh, in the, you know, 20th, uh, 20th century. Uh, he, he ran, uh, GE from 1981 to 2001. Uh, and, you know, essentially, uh, it would be, you know, as if Apple or Google or Microsoft suddenly, uh, you know, lost all of its oomph, uh, and, you know, broke itself up into, you know, all these different parts and, became much less important and much less valuable than it once was. You would scratch, you know, if, if, uh, Apple suddenly went out of business, you'd scratch your head and say, you know, what, the, what the heck happened here? And you'd want to, you know, most people would want to know why that happened. And so GE was sort of like Apple and Google and Microsoft all rolled into one. It was a technological leader. It was, a uh, a leader of finance. Uh, it was a management uh, leader. I mean, it was a, one of the most emulated, well-regarded uh, conglomerates in the world. And, uh, you know, now it's in the process of breaking itself up into three pieces uh, and disappearing. 
from the landscape. Uh, and so I wanted to know how and why that happened. Uh, uh, so that was so uh, one uh, uh, reason, very important reason. I mean, all of my books uh, have a sort of a element of mystery about them. You know, like I wrote a book about the collapse of Bear Stearns uh, uh, after during the financial crisis of 2008 called House of Cards. And again, I, you know, Bear Stearns had been around for 85 years uh, until it disappeared in, in a week's time. Uh, in March of uh, 2008, and I wanted to know what happened. Uh, basically, you know, there was a dead body on the floor. I wanted to know how it got there. So I took a blank piece of paper and went about figuring it out. Uh, the same thing in this situation. With one, uh, you know, important difference, I guess, in that uh, when I started G Capital in 1987, I shared an office uh, with a guy named John Flannery, who went on to become the CEO of GE uh, in uh, after Jeff Immelt got fired uh, uh, as CEO in uh, June of uh, 2017. Um, and, uh, you know, I've known John for since 1987. Uh, so, uh, you know, he was a, a friend of mine and somebody I knew. And, uh, you know, people were telling me that, you know, about all of these crazy things uh, that were going on there. And, uh, you know, once uh, John unfortunately got fired uh, from his job uh, as CEO uh, in October of 2018, so he was CEO for about 15 months, uh, I decided that I needed to figure out what happened to this once great company. And, uh, you know, once again, took a bl blank sheet of paper and called up Jack Welch, who was still alive, and uh, uh, asked him if he would talk to me. And uh, he agreed to talk to me. So I was off to the races. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, amazing that you have personal connections like that. Normally, people approach a, a story like totally like you're a total stranger. Uh, it's uh, interesting that you had personal, personal, many personal connections like that. Well, uh, you know, what I realized uh, in all of my books is that I actually have a personal connection to uh, each of the books. Uh, you know, the seven books that I've written, I have a, you know, I had a personal connection to Lazard. I used to compete against Bear Stearns. Uh, I used to compete against Goldman Sachs. I wrote a book about the Duke uh, lacrosse scandal. I'd gone to Duke and knew some of the people uh, involved in that. I wrote a book about my friends from uh, high school, uh, obviously. Uh, so I had a personal connection. So it turns out that uh, either consciously or subconsciously, um, I've written all these books where I do have a personal connection, a little personal connection, not not big, but enough to let make sure that I know the lay of the land and that I don't go in cold. Uh, uh, although, you know, I haven't figured out what I'll do next, but I might try that uh, next time uh, going in uh, cold. So we'll see what happens. Well, it, yeah, it's the old cliche, right? What you know. And yes. sometimes that works out I, for me the best. Yeah, and, and then people, you know, uh, people used to say, uh, you know, uh, invest in what you know, uh, and that, you know, will help you too. Uh, so I definitely tend to write about what I know uh, or, again, have some... Uh, sense that I will uh, have some access um, yeah yeah which which is important uh, I don't I don't I don't uh I mean I'll do it if I don't get access so that's you know n not getting access isn't going to dissuade me but um you know it just I just know it'll be better if I can get uh access to the top guys and uh and women and and knock wood I've been able to um pretty much every time yeah, it makes makes uh, writing a book a lot easier. 
so I, I, when GE, when people mention GE, I would think, or at least for myself, people would think, hey, Thomas Edison, uh, the, he had a part, part in putting it together, when in reality, he was kind of pushed aside uh, by, by what you said, the money men. It was kind of interesting. I mean, I uh, obviously didn't didn't know that I like everybody else, and I worked at GE as you correctly pointed out for two years. Uh, uh, and even when I uh, uh, another sort of coincident uh, uh, coincidence uh, was when I was at Columbia Journalism School before going to business school uh, there, uh, I was asked if I wanted to go on a GE sponsored trip uh, to GE's, uh, to Cleveland to see the GE lighting center, you know, where they make light bulbs and also to Louisville, Kentucky, where they were making their major appliances, dishwashers and refrigerators and washing machines and all of that. I don't even know why I was asked. Uh, I don't even know why they did it, uh, but I, uh, I, I was part of, uh, a small group of Columbia Journalism school, school students who flew on GE's private jet uh, to for a day to to Cleveland, and then had you know saw their uh, a, a light bulb factory, and then on to Louisville, Kentucky, and saw their uh, major appliance uh, manufacturing plant, and then you know came back to New York, um, you know, and even then you know I. I, like everybody else, believed that, uh, you know, Thomas Edison was the founder of GE. That's what they told us. That's what I always believed. That's what they've always said. Uh, but as I was researching uh, the book, you know, and I, for whatever reason, decided I had to go back to, you know, the 1890s to figure out how this company all came about. Uh, and I learned that actually uh, Thomas Edison had very little to do with the creation of GE. Uh, he was against uh, the merger of his company with a, another company that a guy named Charles Coffin owned uh, 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 to merge that became the merger in 1892 that created General Electric. There were these sort of two competing uh, electric uh, uh, power manufacturing companies. In other words, they created the electricity that went on to the, and then they owned the grids that got you know, believe it or not, there was a time before we took electricity for granted, and you know there was there was uh, uh, electric power uh, uh, generated generation before there were the grids to deliver the electric power to customers. And in fact, there was a lot of problems with uh, fires uh, related to uh, the electric uh, grid system uh, before it became. Uh, you know, perfected, and we now, of course, take it for granted. But uh, uh, Thomas Edison created something called Edison General Electric, uh, and uh, was the you know CEO of that company for a while. But then got pushed out by the money men. Uh, you know, he started that company with uh, J.P. Morgan, the man, uh, providing the capital, uh, and uh, a guy by the name of Henry Villard, who had been a a, an investment banker and then a sort of a railroad tycoon. And he was actually the CEO of Edison General Electric because they had pushed out Thomas Edison. And then they merged it with this company that uh, uh, Charles Coffin uh, had bought uh, basically out of bankruptcy, but uh, had managed to run it very well. And so in 1892, uh, the, the financial backers behind Coffin's company, uh, who were up in Boston, got together with uh, Henry Villard and J.P. Morgan, the man, uh, and decided to merge the two companies. Thomas Edison was against that merger. Uh, he owned some equity in his company, but that got diluted down in the merger, and soon enough he got pushed out and left the company altogether with Charles Coffin uh, taking over as the CEO of the combined company. Uh, that was in 1892. So basically, uh, Thomas Edison, who was against the merger, uh, against the combination, didn't want it to happen, 
his voice was completely uh, silenced. I would say he pretty much had nothing to do uh, with the creation of GE, despite all the mythology uh, that he did. Now, uh, obviously, you know, like, and then, you know, uh, uh, back on the one day that GE was cooperating with me in the writing of this book, they allowed me to go to their research center uh, outside of Albany, New York. And, you know, they have this incredible, you know, big building uh, up there. And, uh, uh, you know, you walk into the lobby, which is very grand. Uh, and, you know, all this uh, iconography uh, about Thomas Edison being the founder of GE, you know, including having his desk that's there and like other things that he created uh, that he uh, discovered, uh, 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 you know, like the ticker machine that was used on Wall Street are all there and, you know, reference to his patents and all. But, you know, he had nothing, very little to do with the, with the creation of GE. Uh, it was all the, you know, it was all the, the, the guys, uh, the venture capitalists that had created, uh, that had backed his company and then helped Charles Coffin uh, buy his company, this competing company out of bankruptcy with Charles Coffin running uh, the combined firm. Uh, and then in 1893, there was a financial crisis um, and GE almost went out of business because they had too much debt. They had $10 million of debt. Uh, and once again, they had to turn to JP Morgan, the man, uh, to get permission to buy their debt back at a discount. So it's quite possible, uh, that there would be no GE today or, you know, what became GE, uh, if they hadn't, you know, sort of worked their way out of the financial crisis of 1893 by buying their debt back at a discount. Uh, and, and which is what sort of makes uh, it so ironic that it was the financial crisis of 2008 that pretty much set GE on its path to dissolution that's happening uh, now. Uh, so, yeah, definitely. Now, uh, uh, Ms. Mr. Coffin, Charles Coffin, was seemed like pretty interesting character, and the. One one thing that uh, stood out to me is how he, uh, well, uh, the electricity was provided by these little companies here and there. Uh, there like you said, there wasn't a real grid as we know now. Or, and, or customers. Yeah, it's, I mean, and it's risky. Coffin bought, bought them all. But started. Yeah, he's foretold. He foretold. It was like a picture of the the company's future. He he made all these acquisitions. He he not only uh, made a bunch of acquisitions uh, and integrated them and made them work. He also provided uh, financing for customers. Uh, you know, he he uh, created a a separate. Uh, eventually what became a separate company uh, that provided the financing to customers to buy the equipment to create the electricity and then the electric electrical grid uh, so that their customers could have electricity. So it was this sort of vertically integrated uh, financial uh, and electrical a company uh, that uh, basically kept uh, its customers afloat by providing the financing for them to buy their, you know, electrical uh, uh, power equipment. Again, which, you know, became something that uh, occurred, you know, again and again over time with the creation of of the part of the company that I worked for, which was GE Capital, originally known as GE Credit, uh, providing uh, financing for customers to buy uh, GE's products during the Great Depression, when people wanted, uh, you know, the latest appliances like a refrigerator or a range or whatever, but they couldn't afford it because they couldn't have access to capital because the financial system was in a shambles and GE provided uh, financing for customers to buy these appliances uh, during uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, over time, uh, GE became uh, more and more successful doing that and any number of other things. Uh, 
including, you know, being an M&A and buying all these companies uh, and had a AAA credit rating, uh, which meant that it could borrow money very cheaply, inexpensively. And uh, then, you know, basically Jack Welch, uh, when he started running uh, GE uh, Credit, which became GE Capital, he decided to essentially arbitrage uh, GE's low cost of capital, uh, and he would borrow cheaply, uh, and then GE Capital would use that capital uh, and lend it out to companies uh, all over the world uh, much more expensively, uh, including, you know, taking equity positions in these companies, just like they had done, you know, uh, in the 1890s. Uh, and, you know, we're making a fortune. And as an unregulated bank, G Capital became like the fourth largest bank in the country uh, and was completely unregulated. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, I mean, it started off so, so small, but became such a profit center uh, for the company that it just, uh, it, uh, it became, became really important. But yeah, like you said, it was unregulated. Uh, now, with arbitrage, was it, do you mean if it borrows short, it was like borrowing against it, or just uh, simply? No, no. Uh, I, me I meant that it was taking advantage of the fact that um, uh, it could borrow as much money as it needed or wanted to, relatively expensive, inexpensively. So, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Like it could borrow money uh, in the, on a short-term basis. Uh, in the commercial paper market, well, for 60 or 90 or 120 days at, you know, at just over the cost of, uh, you know, the U.S. government's borrowing rate. So depending what interest rates were at the time, but, you know, as an example, it could borrow uh, as much money as it wanted at like 3% interest, right? So it had to pay 3% yeah. interest, and then it would lend it out at uh, 10, 11, 12% interest rates. Uh, uh, so it would capture that spread between what it could borrow for 3% and what it could lend for 12%. So that 900 basis points, that nine percentage points of interest on lots of lots and lots of money, like billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, that became its profit along with, you know, fees that it would get for doing these deals, as well as, you know, equity positions that would take in the companies. Uh, that uh, uh, it do deals for, as well as you know, buying huge amounts of real estate and other businesses, uh, and so it just became this huge uh, profit uh, center under Jack Welch. And as Jack told me, you know, he he found that it was a lot easier to make money from money than uh, uh, making money uh, from making things like aircraft engines or x-ray machines you know obviously they still did that but that was a much more complicated way to make money it was much easier to make money from money by borrowing cheaply and lending it uh expensively now of course that's a formula uh for disaster uh because uh you know that's how banks get into trouble all the time they borrow short and lend long they borrow for a short period of time and they lend money for a long period of time. Uh, and as you know, that's fine as long as uh, people don't get spooked out by that and want their money back at the same time or the short term uh, money market uh, dries up uh, as happened in 2008. So, uh, you know, it's a great business until it's not anymore. And, yeah. Well, uh, it's fine if you understand that, but if you don't understand the risks in that business, then you can get in a lot of trouble. Yeah, like uh, there are times when it doesn't didn't have enough money to cover its liabilities. Uh, something like eight to one, you said in your book, uh, and it just uh, and it go and uh, their involvement in something. Uh, like uh, Kidder Peabody and uh, WMC Mortgage with a credit default swap. So 
2008 crisis, that just, it's like money just gone. Yeah, so they, again, they, uh, obviously, d different periods of time, different things happened. Uh, you know, in 1986, uh, Jack Welch uh, decided to buy uh, RCA, which owned NBC. Uh, that was, uh, you know, the, the biggest M and A deal of all of all time to that point, at six point four billion dollars. Uh, and you know, Jack was on the front page of the New York Times. This was the biggest deal of all time. You know, buying NBC, uh, and it turned out that G uh, was actually buying back NBC. GE had. Uh, was ordered essentially by Wildrow Wilson, President Wilson, after World War I to uh, create what became RCA and NBC uh, and then had to divest it uh, in the 1930s because uh, the, the antitrust issues. And so Jack was actually just buying it back, but he was sort of so, you know, giddy from doing that deal that he decided the next year to, to uh, buy Kidder Peabody, which was a Wall Street investment bank, an old line Wall Street investment bank. And that was, that turned out to be a financial mess uh, for Jack uh, right from the get-go. Uh, he ended up uh, making it, making money because uh, he uh, d figured out a way to sell Kidder Peabody to Payne Weber. And then Payne Weber was sold to a big Swiss bank, UBS. Uh, and Jack managed to make, you know, $2 billion on his investment uh, of Kidder Peabody, which was $600 million. So it all worked out in the end, but but it was a mess. Um, so that was sort of one uh, mistake that Jack made. But, you know, fast forward to, to 2008 when, uh, you know, Jack was gone and Jeff Immelt was his successor and G, you know, had put itself at risk because uh, it, it was wholly reliant on uh, getting its uh, capital that it needed, uh, you know, from the short-term commercial paper markets. And in 2000, September of 2008, those markets seized up, you know, after Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed, after Bear Stearns collapsed, after it looked like Wall Street was going to go down the tubes and GE couldn't finance itself. And so it had borrowed all this money on a short-term basis and had to pay that back. But, you know, it had lent all that money out for five, seven, 10 years. And obviously that money couldn't come back in time. So it had a liquidity crunch and it had to, uh, you know, Jeff Immelt had to go hat in hand to to Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, and nobody remembers this now, but because uh, everybody was focused on Wall Street, but GE had to, you know, ask for the help from the Treasury and then from Sheila Bear at the FDIC. And if they hadn't gotten that help, GE would have gone bankrupt as well as Lehman. But they did get the help and they didn't go bankrupt. But that set GE on the path that now, 14 years later, is led to its break up well that, i'd like to ask you about jack welch uh you had a number of talks with him about the book and as you, he and his story is you talk about a lot in his book uh and he's yeah, it's a great pretty story. remarkable it's character great character what uh, uh no, i mean he's, he, go ahead what do what what thoughts come to mind about him now? Look, I mean, I think he was, uh, uh, you know, he was heralded as a great corporate leader. And uh, I know there's now, you know, a bunch of revisionist history and arguments against him. Some people think he, you know, ruined corporate America. Uh, I, I don't think that's right at all. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to him, interviewing him, and interviewing many, many, many of the people who work directly for him, and they uh, they revere him. Uh, they were inspired by him. Uh, they were uh, uh, he managed to get uh, out of them, you know, more productivity uh, than uh, you know any other leader had done. He 
uh, you know, they think he was uh, a visionary. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, when uh, objective measures are used, like, uh, you know, when he took over uh, GE in uh, 1981, the company was worth $12 billion, which is, you know, not nothing back in 1981. But, uh, you know, uh, basically a year before he left in August of 2000, uh, GE was uh, worth $650 billion. It was the most valuable company in the world, the most respected company in the world. And that happened in the course of 20 years under Jack's leadership. So uh, by any objective measure, you know, like we like to, you know, everybody thinks the world of Apple now because it's, you know, worth two and a half trillion dollars, which is, you know, un extraordinary. And, you know, when Tim Cook took that company over from after Steve Jobs' death, uh, Apple was worth 300 billion. Now it's worth two and a half trillion. So by any objective measure, Tim Cook did an incredible job. I mean, you know, saying Jack Welch, you know, did not do the kind of job that Tim Cook uh, has done at Apple would be a ridiculous statement. And then when you combine that with the people who worked for him, who revere him, and who've gone on to be CEOs of, of Boeing or Honeywell or Home Depot or 3M or any number of other uh, companies, uh, uh, you know, you, you have to say to yourself that this guy uh, was, you know, an extraordinary business leader. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, he uh, uh, basically uh, played by the rules as they were at that time. And he made sure not to disappoint, uh, you know, investors and, and the research analysts that covered GE on Wall Street. Uh, and I found him to be uh, charming, open, opinionated, confident, uh, and, you know, he was definitely trying to, uh, spin me to make sure that I, uh, wrote things the way he wanted, but, you know, uh, I was happy to listen to him and, but I just, uh, uh, wrote, I was completely objective and wrote the, uh, the, the book, uh, based on the facts as they, uh, as I uncovered them, uh, you know, uh, from the beginning of the company to the, to the end and including, Jack's 20 year uh, reign at the top. Uh, and I think he did incredible things at that company. Not, not perfectly. He was by no means a, uh, he was, uh, you know, a perfect human being. He was flawed in many ways, like the rest of us and, and maybe in exaggerated ways, uh, even more flawed than the rest of us. Uh, but he, uh, uh, you know, he was a great leader, uh, a unique leader and, uh, uh, you know, his, uh, successor couldn't match up to him. Uh, maybe few people could have, uh, uh, but no, I, I found him to be incredible. I, you know, I was always impressed with Jeff Immelt as well as a person who was his successor. But I mean, again, I think if you look at objectively at the facts of what happened uh, after, uh, Jack, uh, relinquished the reins to Jeff Immelt, it just wasn't the same company anymore. And, uh, you know, uh, Jeff uh, uh, made, uh, you know, again, just object looking at it objectively, he made uh, a lot of mistakes that hurt the company, a lot of decisions that hurt the company and, uh, you know, frankly led to where we are today. Would you, and a couple of weeks ago, uh, Bob Iger returned to Disney as uh, chief CEO, replacing his successor, Bob Chapek, which he had, I believe he had an input on uh, for right. choosing a successor. Yeah. Uh, would, did you ever get this feeling in talking to Jack that he would have uh, gladly stepped back when mm -hmm. Jeff Immelt wasn't doing so hot? Well, he, he definitely told me uh, that he felt he'd made a mistake, a big mistake in choosing Jeff Immelt. Uh, and he, I think, wondered why the board of directors of GE 
kept Jeff around for as long as they did. Now, of course, I found that to be an ironic uh, observation on Jack's part because Jack selected Jeff, just like Bob Iger selected Bob Chapek. Uh, but, you know, like everything these days, uh, things happen a lot more quickly today these days than they did once upon a time. So the Disney board, you know, stepped in and made the change and brought back Iger after two and a half years. You know, it took the GE board more than 17 years to, uh, or about 17 years to uh, replace Jeff Immelt to realize it had made a mistake with Jeff Immelt. Um, and then uh, his replacement, John Flannery, uh, again, who I knew from my days at GE Capital, uh, you know, he only lasted 15 months. So again, he was sort of on a Bob Chapek like timeline, again, indicative of how things just happen more quickly today. But in answer to your question, no, by the time I spoke to Jack, uh, which was in, uh, be you know, beginning in uh, 2018, and then he died in March of 2020, uh, no, there was no thought of Jack returning, you know, like there was no thought of Jack returning. That was never uh, contemplated. Uh, uh, you know, it might have been contemplated potentially, you know, uh, in the earlier years of Jeff Immelt's tenure, but no one was thinking of replacing Jeff Immelt uh, back then. So by the time they were thinking of replacing Jeff Immelt, you know, again, in the, you know, around the 2017 timeframe, uh, you know, Jack was, uh, you know, no, no longer uh, in a position to return to the company. By then he was in his, you know, 80s oh, uh, and, yeah. and not in yeah. great health. <laughs> so uh, he wasn't going to come back. But uh, I think that uh, Jack, uh, uh, if he had uh, had a say in the situation, probably would have, uh, even though he selected Jeff Immelt uh, and he had a lot of candidates he could have selected who weren't Jeff Immelt, uh, I think he would have uh, uh, voted to replace Jeff Immelt sooner than the board actually did. Now, uh, uh, you worked with John Flannery uh, in the early part of your career. And uh, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Flannery had a, such a short stint as uh, CEO due to a number of things like uh, uh, try on uh, the predatory uh, uh, share uh, investing company a number of things uh, and things were uh, going downhill but what from what you talked I guess I wanted to explore what John, John Flannery said about his time as CEO like did, did he have a sense that he could maybe right the ship or was things going in a certain direction that he couldn't stop? Well, I think he uh, was surprised by, you know, uh, it was kind of a shotgun uh, uh, marriage, if, if you will. I mean, uh, the succession process by which Jeff Immelt was selected was like this two-year, you know, drama uh, that was on the front pages uh, for a long time, uh, and culminating in in two th in two thousand in the selection of Jeff Immelt, uh, you know, and you know Jeff Immelt's uh, departure in June two thousand seventeen uh, was. Uh, uh, pretty shocking uh and while the you know the board had begun thinking that uh jeff immelt would be leaving uh in 2017 which was probably three years early because i think uh, jeff immelt was selected to stay 20 years as ceo like jack had been 20 years ceo uh so it wasn't uh, completely done out of the blue, but it was done very rapidly, sort of beginning in the February or March timeframe. They began to, you know, whittle down 
the the candidates who might replace Jeff, and then you know John was ultimately uh, selected and uh, announced in June, uh, and then took over, I believe, in in August. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, relatively quickly, uh, some of the things that uh, John Flannery uh, was not aware of, uh, you know, John Flannery was running the healthcare business. He had actually turned around the healthcare business, which was probably why he was selected uh, to be the CEO by the board, uh, quickly discovered uh, some uh, serious problems that uh, people just weren't aware of. And it was whether or not, you know, J Jeff Immelt uh, was sort of naive about them or was aware of them, but, uh, uh, you know, didn't, uh, uh, you know, make a big deal out of them. Uh, you know, there was uh, this uh, liability that uh, cropped up relatively quickly in the long-term uh, health uh, business GE had a in, owned and still owned an insurance company that provided long-term healthcare benefits with people living uh, longer and spending more time in nursing homes. This was pre-pandemic, actually. Ironically, I think the pre-pandemic began to reverse some of that, but this was pre-pandemic. Uh, uh, GE had a huge liability that nobody uh, had really focused on, although Jeff Immelt could have got sold that company when they packaged up GE's uh, insurance businesses um, in uh, an IPO called Genworth Financial in 2004 timeframe. Uh, Jeff Immelt could have put this company that was in Overland Park, Kansas uh, into that uh, uh, IPO, but chose not to. Uh, that became a firestorm of a liability that uh, really uh, hurt uh, GE's credibility that John Flannery had to bring to the forefront. Uh, there was also problems, big problems in the uh, uh, GE's power business, the original business, uh, Edison's and Coffin's original business uh, had a whole host of uh, problems that John Flannery also had to bring to the forefront again, you know, costing billions of dollars in in losses and write offs, and sort of the combination of those two things with, as you mentioned, Nelson Peltz, uh, the uh, uh, hedge fund manager at Tryon Capital, Tryon Partners that Jeff Immelt had brought in in 2015 uh, when he decided to sell off GE Capital. Uh, you know, uh, the stock price, you know, as a result of these uh, problems that John Flannery had surfaced that obviously he had nothing to do with, uh, but that he had to deal with as CEO, uh, you know, the stock price under John Flannery's tenure went from about $25 a share to $10 a share. Uh, needless to say, Tryon Partners was not happy about that and uh, 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 essentially engineered a coup that got rid of John Flannery after 15 months and brought in Larry Culp, who John Flannery had brought onto the board. He had been the CEO of Danaher, which was another uh, much smaller conglomerate. Uh, and, uh, you know, Tryon Partners teamed up with Larry Culp uh, and got rid of John Flannery. And, uh, you know, after 15 months, so John Flannery uh, didn't really have a chance to uh, implement his vision for the company. He was sort of drinking from the fire hose and spending all this time putting out the, 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 the fires that had sort of the conflagrations that had uh, cropped up under Jeff Immelt's uh, tenure. Uh, but he didn't get a chance to put out those fires and implement his vision, uh, which actually happened to be a breakup of the company as well, that, you know, Larry Culp swooped in, uh, you know, took uh, John Flannery's uh, vision for the company to break it up uh, and implemented it. And that's basically uh, where we are now. You know, it, it sort of reminds me of, um, you know, sometimes when uh, uh, a pope, uh, you, know, you, you know, the secrecy around a pope being uh, uh, a new pope being selected, you know, when the, the 
the white puffs of smoke and the black puffs of smoke. And uh, uh, I even named, I had one of my chapters uh, uh, named Hobbyist after that. Hoppiest Popham. Uh, Hoppiest Popham, uh, uh, which was sort of how Immelt was selected. But, you know, the, there have been like short tenured, uh, like John Paul II, I guess, was a very short tenured pope. Uh, and that was sort of like John Flannery in my mind. Uh, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't even have a chance to uh, uh, put out the fires that had started under Jeff Immelt. You know, he, he, he realized there were fires. He tried to put them out, but before he could even put them out, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, eliminated uh, you know, with uh, extreme prejudice. And then they bring in, you know, Larry Culp, and he just basically implements John Flannery's vision for the company and then, you know, tries to take all the credit. But in fact, uh, you know, at this point, at this point uh, the patient was uh, on life support. Uh, you know, he's really done nothing to improve the GE stock price. Uh, but he has enriched himself. He became the first CEO in GE's history to have a, a, a an employment contract, which paid him twenty five million dollars a year. Uh, and then uh, uh, he also had a heavily uh, stock uh, incentivized uh, 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 pay package, uh, but. Uh, you know, based on achieving certain stock prices, he would get rewarded with a lot of stock that would be vested and worth a lot of money. Uh, but during the pandemic, uh, you know, because obviously uh, people weren't buying jet engines or power systems, you know, uh, as we know, uh, a lot of things were depressed. Some things, of course, took off, but basically GE's big uh, uh, technology, you know, expensive technology was not selling at that time. The stock price got as low as around $6 a share. He recut all of his options so that they would be much easier for him to achieve the stock rewards that he hoped he was going to get when he first took over in October of 2018. And next thing you know, coming out of the pandemic, uh, the stock, you know, took off, came off of its lows and you know, he immediately, uh, in, in short order, invested in uh, something like $100 million of GE stock. So in addition to getting uh, uh, paid $25 million a year, he then got uh, another $100 million uh, vested in GE stock, which he will get as long as he remains CEO, of course, which he will do. Uh, and uh, so he enriched himself, long story short, uh, uh, and GE shareholders have basically taken it on the chin. Well, uh, running uh, uh, out of time here, just one more comment and question. Uh, when I started reading, comment is that when I started reading the book, I uh, looked in my LinkedIn feed, linkedin.com, and what do I see? GE, an ad for these three companies, uh, uh, the uh, Vernovo, uh, which is the power business, yeah, GE Healthcare, and what will be GE, which will be just the jet engine business, right? And I guess the question is, uh, uh, what do you, what do you think of GE's future? What do you think it will be? Well, it, it it won't be as uh, the world's most admired company. It won't be as uh, uh, you know the most powerful and important conglomerate in the history of conglomerates. Uh, you know, it still has uh, a very uh, attractive uh, technology. Uh, to be honest, uh, you know the G GE jet engines are uh, the you know probably the number one market share. Uh, the, the most advanced and sophisticated jet engines. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, when it comes to jet engines, uh, nobody wants there to be any problems with a jet engine. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll put up with some, uh, you know, mistakes when it comes to, you know, whether your uh, bags get to the right place uh, that you put on the aircraft. But most people don't want any... Uh, problems to arise in their jet engines. 
uh, and uh, uh, there's like no tolerance for problems with jet engines. So GE's done a very good job with its jet engines, and it's creating uh, new jet engines that are either uh, you know rely on electricity, uh, believe it or not, or hydrogen as opposed to uh, jet fuel, uh, trying to become much greener. Uh, uh, you know, it's GE. Uh, you know, windmills uh, are uh, some of the most sophisticated and powerful in the world. Uh, GE's, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthcare equipment, you know, imaging, MRI machines, CAT scans, X-ray machines are among the leaders uh, in the world and the most uh, technologically advanced. Uh, and it's, you know, power uh, plant. Uh, business, the electric uh, power plants that it makes, uh, you know, has number one uh, market share still or thereabouts. It's still a dominant player in that business. But, you know, most, uh, even though there are probably a billion people without electric power on the earth, uh, or maybe more, uh, you know, probably not as many electric power plants are being bought uh, and sold, uh, as once was the case. Uh, and, um, you know, that business struggles to be right-sized so that it can be profitable again. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the healthcare business, which is being spun off, uh, early next year is going to do fine, uh, and will probably get bought. Uh, the jet engine business, uh, you know, is still a powerhouse, uh, and that, uh, will be its own separate public company, and that'll probably be fine. Uh, I'm not sure whether that gets bought or not. That might be too much for another company to buy, but might might get bought. I think the company that's going to struggle uh, the most is GE Vernova, the uh, power business, again, which was GE's original business. Um, you know, there's only a few companies uh, in the world that could possibly buy it, and uh, uh, Siemens or Mitsubishi, uh, I just don't see them, either one of them, being able to buy it from an antitrust point of view. I don't think anybody else is going to buy it either, uh, and I think that'll probably struggle as a public company. Okay. Well, uh, now is the time for questions and answers, if anybody has them. You can use the chat feature, or actually the Q&A feature, on the bo bottom of your screen, or if you're comfortable, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. So feel free. Well, I'll, I'll throw people one are out shy there. shy and dearborn tonight. <laughs> I'll throw one out to get started. Uh, what was the most surprising thing that you found out in your writing this book about GE? What just like, wow, wowed you? Well, obviously, when I first sat down to my first visit with Jack Welch uh, at the uh, one of his golf clubs in Nantucket, we, he invited me for lunch. Uh, and he first thing out of his mouth is that he made a big mistake in choosing Jeff Immelt as his successor. Uh, that completely surprised me, blew me away. I had no idea he felt that way. I had no idea uh, that he would be so uh, frank and outspoken about it. Uh, so that surprised me. And so, and he brought it up every other time I talked to him. So that whole a vein of uh, conversation really surprised me. Uh, but as I uh, uh, said said before, I was also quite surprised to learn that Thomas Edison really didn't have much to do with the creation of GE. Uh, I uh, was quite surprised to learn that GE went, almost went out of business uh, a year after it was founded because of the financial crisis of 1893. And of course, I was very surprised to find out that um, uh, Woodrow Wilson had basically ordered GE to start RCA inside of GE, and then the Justice Department forced GE to sell RCA in the early 1930s, only to have Jack buy it back in 1986, uh, 1985 and 1986. So I was 
uh, quite uh, surprised uh, to learn uh, all of those things. And then, you know, all sorts of other things along the way uh, in terms of the internal squabbles and fighting and behavior that, you know, is frankly, uh, I found in every book that I've done, uh, you know, whether it be about Lazard or Bear Stearns or Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, there's always something going on at these places. It's, you know, they present this uh, image of harmony and, and joyfulness and wonderfulness and, you know, and back behind the scenes, back behind the curtain, of course, uh, you know, people are people and they misbehave and they treat each other poorly uh, often. And so uh, that always becomes great fodder for me in my books. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll check the Q&A here. Uh, let's see. Well, got a question. What is your writing process, I guess? How do you approach things when you write about them, I take it? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, ancient Chinese proverb, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Uh, you know, you have to, you know, the paper is blank. There's nothing more uh, uh, intimidating than a blank sheet of paper uh, when you have a you know, it's all, it's incredibly exciting to uh, get uh, a book contract, uh, especially a topic that you're excited about. And then you're, you know, that's all great. Uh, and there's a lot of celebra celebration uh, after that. And you realize, you know, you're going to have some money coming in, not a lot, but, you know, to keep you going. And then you're faced with actually having to begin uh, researching, reporting, interviewing, and then writing this book. Uh, and that is incredibly intimidating and daunting. And, you know, I do my own research. I do my own uh, interviewing. Uh, I do my own writing, obviously. And so I don't have anybody working with me or helping me. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, very intimidating uh, process. Now, obviously, you know, I like it uh, most of the time, uh, but it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. It's a lot of very hard work and it's a lot of very lonely work. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's also rewarding when you get to this point. Yeah. Very rewarding. All right. Uh, not necessarily financially, but intellectually very rewarding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you've created something. So uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, go ahead, Ryan. Um, how did um, the body uh, get found? Was there like a mystery behind it or anything like that? What what body? The the maybe, dead body that was the mentioned? dead body on the floor kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I had to, you know figure that out Ryan uh and you know I figured that out by talking to a lot of people and doing a lot of research and I think um it was sort of a combination of uh uh poor decisions uh you know starting you know don't you know you know in fairness to Jeff you know Imult um you know he took over as GE's CEO you know, four days before September 11th, uh, 2001. Uh, and that first year, as he told me, he really only had one good day. Uh, that was September 10th. He was in Seattle about to meet with the CEO of Boeing on September 11th. You know, GE made the jet engines on the planes. GE had re reinsured the buildings down at the World Trade Center and lost, uh, you know, two of its employees that got killed that day. Thought that maybe it had trained at a training center uh, in, that it owned in, uh, in a pilot training center that it owned in Florida. They thought that it thought that they might have trained one of the hijackers uh, who had a similar name to somebody else they had trained, but wasn't one of the hijackers. So, you know, and then... That, you know, that we had the, all the scandals involving 
you know, WorldCom and Enron and, um, you know, new Sarbanes-Oxley, new regulation got put in place that required the CEO and the CFO to sign off on their financial statements. So basically the world changed rapidly uh, after September 11th for Jeff Immelt. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think until really the financial crisis of 2008, he was he was doing okay. I would say, you know, he was warned about things going on at GE Capital that he ignored. As I said before, he could have put this company that ensured long-term health uh, uh, care uh, uh, into a, this Genworth Financial that they had spun off in 2004, and he didn't do that. Uh, which was a big mistake, uh, turned out. Uh, maybe easy to, more easy to see in hindsight than at the time, but still could have done it. He chose not to. Um, you know, he, some would say he overpaid for companies that he bought and uh, uh, sold others too cheaply. Uh, but I think, you know, it's pretty clear to me that... Um, uh, 2008 financial crisis really um, uh, put GE on a path uh, from which it never recovered. Uh, and you, you know, if you read the book, you will see what uh, what happened, the the things that uh, took place uh, that uh, from which it couldn't really recover. Uh, uh, you know, and by the time he was fired in 2017. Uh, you know, the, the, the company was really uh, on a path to being broken up, which, you know, obviously was a huge, uh, uh, huge uh, bitter pill for Jack Welch to swallow, which is sort of why he was so angry uh, at, at Jeff Immelt by the time that I came around to interview him for this book. Okay. Um... Anyone else with a question? Um, yeah, why did um, why did Jeff get fired? Were there any reasons or anything like that? Uh, I mean, I think that um, he had uh, in 2015 he had decided to uh, sell off GE Capital, which had uh, uh, was providing something like 50% of GE's earnings. Uh, he advertised that he was going to sell it. Uh, so, you know, that on the other hand, that one hand that brought in buyers, but on the other hand, he also announced that he had to sell it or wanted to sell it. And so, you know, uh, buyers took advantage of that. He decided to use the proceeds from the sale of various parts of GE Capital, something like 30 or $40 billion dollars, to buy back GE stock uh, at something like $40 a share. And that was a high point for GE stock, which is of course never got anywhere near again. Uh, so, you know, instead of paying down debt or, you know, doing something else with that money, he bought back shares to try to reduce the denominator of the number of shares outstanding so that, you know, the, he had promised he was going to make $2 a share in 2018. And, uh, you know, basically that he didn't even get close to uh, uh, making that number. And, uh, you know, when you promise Wall Street, you're going to make $2 a share and it comes in at around a dollar a share, that's a major miss. And uh, uh, he had promised that. And basically, you know, he had a very poor meeting with uh, Wall Street analysts in May of 2017. After that meeting, uh, which was in Florida, uh, you know, uh, uh, the board uh, and Tryon Partners uh, basically decided that the time was up for Jeff. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, attending tonight. And a big thank you to William Cohen. Thank you for joining us tonight. I My appreciate pleasure. your time. Thank you for having me. And uh, good luck with the book. It's uh, Power Failure. And it's available at any bookseller out there.
So yes, thank you all. It makes a great uh, holiday gift, as they say. <laughs> Have a good night and good luck with thank your you. book. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.